So I'm going to talk about um, exploring double consciousness using holotech to develop hyperhumanism. And this is what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about double consciousness, what it is. We're going to talk about creating feedback loops. We'll talk about pain as an interface, time as a new sense, out of body um, experience and cognition, wearable experience, moist media, and the whole holotech stuff. So it's three parts to the talk, basically. And then we're going to go on to the last part, which is the humanism, transhumanism, posthumanism, hyperhumanism, and finish with some looking, well, basically looking at different types of operating systems that we can adopt. So our perceptions are gambles. We believe what we see, and then we believe our interpretation of it. We don't even know we are making an interpretation most of the time. We think this is reality. But perception is not something that happens to us or in us. It's something we do. So for instance, here, you can see this is actually a black and white photograph that's being cleverly manipulated to look like it's color. So the act of observation is involved in the creation of our perceptual universe. To what extent is debatable? I think this is a nice way of actually symbolizing that. So reality, reality itself is under construction. Um, and what does that mean? So that's the kind of focus that we're going to have today. Uh, the main focus for me is the human condition and this idea that we only experience 1% of the visual spectrum, we only experience 1% of the auditory spectrum. So how do we increase um, those ratios? How do we hack the human system with technology, not just digital technology, but all sorts of different technologies? And again, we're going to talk about that today. So if we can only know our reality through experience, how should we understand the production of experience? And that's exactly what I'm trying to do with my work around focusing on context rather than on content. So what are the perceptual bandwidths of our altered states of consciousness, our altered <coughs> traits of consciousness? What are the limits of what we can do with these altered states? And also, what are the limits of our media? What are the boundaries of our media? We all know that we've been zombified with the smartphone. So what about people that are looking at, you know, the, the recent uh, survey taking place, students given the option of keeping their smartphone or keeping their sense of smell. And they actually chose to keep their smartphones in a great majority. <laughs> so what the hell? I mean, uh, I recently had an experience where I, my, the touch screen on my phone broke. Um, and, I, and I felt like I was locked in to my body, because obviously my phone is such an extension of my body that I was literally disabled, in it, and it was really, really awful. And then I found a way, thanks to Tristan, to actually plug a dongle into my phone and, and actually control it with a mouse and a keyboard. And I felt this incredible sense of being unlocked. So Chris Timmerman here modeling that. Um, so McLuhan's warned against too much human extension into technology and has said that every media extension of man is an amputation. So this is a real key concern. How do we use these technologies? Poorly designed technologies have the potential to bring about the arrested development in the natural evolution of higher human faculties. So we'll start with a little video. Some strange kind of place. <clears throat> Half halfway house between oneself and something else. Would you like to take two little pills more? Do you think I should? Even if I went somewhere completely different, would that be the solution? No. Or this is no, that's right. Yes, but it doesn't solve the problem of, of having to be completely oneself something else at the same time, which is like the, the whole secret of life, of course. So I think that's absolutely true, and I think this idea, and it's summarized there, of double consciousness, um, we need to take holidays from ourselves on a regular basis. Um, and I think Huxley's like bang on with his description there. <laughs> So double consciousness is the state of being which gives access at one and the same time to two distinctly fields of experience. And we know this obviously from shamanism, when you're in the everyday world, but also navigating outermost limits of other worlds, 
And this is arguably being uh, mirrored by the ability to move with, within VR and cyberspace whilst also being in, in, the, in the physical world. So this techno shamanism may lead to an evolution of cognition where the subject object relationship is dissolved and reality begins to be actively constructed rather than passively observed. And I think that's a massive call to arms. I had my first sort of experience of double consciousness having an out of body experience at 27. I left my body standing up and walked into an empty room and all of a sudden I was a huge ginormous beam of light um, rotating in a wheel um, and I was told by this sort of disembodied voice um, because then all of a sudden um, eight spokes appeared and I, and I was being told that my soul is inhabiting eight other bodies. Um, and also I was told to look up because this light structure was only part of what I am. But before I could do that, my friend starts to call me and I'm pulled back into my body and I'm still standing up. So it's an incredibly profound experience. It got me into exploring what could have caused it. Um, I looked into DMT. It definitely was not a DMT experience. Um, I read this book about 10 years after that, and this is exactly what it, what it appeared to be. Um, and this is the ore station as a programming center of light. And I'm still trying to work out what the hell that means. Um, I then had a life review um, where I experienced um, my life in reverse. So I was standing, uh, again, just uh, with no warning, I basically had my life go in reverse. Everything was recorded absolutely perfectly. And I was able to quite quickly realize that I was able to leave my body and enter anything else in the scene, uh, which included other people. Uh, so I was in my current state of consciousness, my consciousness going backwards. Then I was able to go into other people, be them. I could become a table, become wood. Um, and also, I got to the point where I was actually having four parallel consciousnesses at once. So now I feel as if I'm, I'm having had that experience, I feel as if you, at death, your life becomes a product and instead of point of view, which is what we have in life, we have field of view. And so now I'm using my life to drive the point of view to access the field of view later on. Um, so another call to arms, in light of massive loss of bi biodiversity on the planet, how can we realize we are nested within an ecology and not just the predators at the top of the food chain? Can adopting forms of double consciousness help us to see ourselves from other perspectives? Will this perspective shift help us to reprogram our associations and enable system, systemic behavior change? So just from what I've told you, um, I'm interested in this question, is living with nested lives a potential way of embodying a nested ecology? So what I'm wearing on my face right now is actually part of a project called Seeing Eye, um, where Mark Farid um, is going to be wearing somebody else for a whole month, so he won't have access to his own eyes or his own hearing. Um, and the practice run, this is Mark. Yeah. Carl Smith, do you give us permission to use this footage for seeing eye related purposes? We do indeed. Excellent. So that's Mark. And what's, what's interesting about, I mean, today was just a serendipitous day. So I'm in the practice run. He's going to wear 10 people in 10 days um, at Ars Electronica. And today is my day to record just by chance. So I hope none of you mind too much. Um, <laughs> So basically, what I'm going to do after this talk is actually go through the exhibition that we have on uh, in the other building um, and go through all the VR experiences whilst living inside a VR experience. So another type of, uh, another type of uh, double consciousness for me is my diary. So I've written a diary for 30 years. I've written it every single day from three levels, from content, what I did, context, what I felt, and concepts what I th thought. And I've only written for five minutes a day, but I've got 30 years of this data. And it's an amazing tool to jump into the overview effect so I can stop being in the point of view and get field of view access. And it forces me to live because I need new material every day. I can read a relationship in an afternoon if it lasted a year. Um, and the really powerful thing is cross sections. So I can take cross sections through that 30 years and look back at this day last year and the year before 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 and get 30 different me's communicating again. And it's just an amazing way of using my memory in a way that I couldn't do naturally. Um, so really interested in turning and feeding that all into an AI um, to basically create a situation where I can ask the AI questions that I can't answer. I know Russell's got comments on that. 
Um, and you can see this cross sections through our current interfaces on Facebook, for instance, you have on this day. And I really like the idea of turning my life into a product, into architecture that I can hack. So also another sort of double consciousness, um, this idea of creating feedback loops. So this is the idea that you can now combine um, an EEG device um, and actually feed that directly into a VR. So you're literally seeing your own brain activity in VR. And as it changes, and you can make it change, then you start to create this feedback loop. And we have an experience called Helium in the showcase as well that's, that you can try. Heather's in the room. She's going to speak a little bit later in the session. And Helium's doing exactly that. The interesting thing about Helium is that it's also an augmented reality device, so you can place your brain activity directly into the world. And I'm very interested in, in what this double consciousness can do in terms of the application areas. For instance, here when uh, looking at giving birth, um, it seems to be very powerful at distracting us from pain or actually creating a layer that we can actually say, um, you know, create a layer between me and my pain and I'll focus on changing that layer rather than the actual pain. So again, reality is a model that we can change. One of the big issues I've got with, you know, you see those cigarette packets with some burnt out lungs, you still buy the cigarette. So there's not enough interactivity there for, you, for it to make a difference. Um, another project I'm involved with just last week, this is a new sense, the sense of time, where I'm going to wear a watch that isn't really a watch, um, but basically enables me to perceive time as a new sense. Um, and the inventor of this uh, new sense has, has been sort of the first astronaut of time. Um, and I think he, he's, he's basically saying it's made him more patient. He, he, time started to go evenly for him instead of this ups and downs, because obviously if you're bored, then time goes slowly. If you're, if you're doing fun stuff, time goes very quickly. But it was completely evened out for him. So he talked about the idea of making pancakes. He was rubbish at making pancakes before, but now he can make perfect pancakes every time because he knows time is moving in a certain way and he can make decisions in a, in a, in a different way. And we can see this potentially when we listen to an audio book and we put it on 1.5 speed and then we go back to normal speed and we can feel that sluggishness. So we can manipulate time, um, but what can we do with it? So on to the next section, out of body cognition. Uh, one of my colleagues actually decided to film herself at work. So she created a camera, set up a camera in the corner of the room and she basically uh, filmed herself for six months and then crunched all that data down to see how she actually behaved with her colleagues compared with her perception of how she behaved. And she was horrified with how rude she was and how different her perception was to reality. Um, interesting work done uh, by Mel Slater where you can actually enter the body of a, you know, a, any, any other kind of person, a different gender. Um, he does interesting stuff with drummers, so you're inside the body of a famous drummer whilst drumming, and your drumming improves. So there's all these little hacks, um, you know, wearable experience. This is another one of the, the pieces in the show, um, a DMT visualizer, and this guy has actually put his DMT, he's wearing his own DMT uh, entity. So more examples of double consciousness. This is a lake above an ocean. I'm interested in accessing liminal spaces between worlds, impossible perspectives, seeing under and over at the same time, playing with perspective to generate these multiple points of view, sunsets on Mars are blue. Um, so these sorts of double spaces that you see here, like this fractal uh, revealing of, of nature, uh, the inside of a violin becoming a music hall, cityscapes revealed inside 3D objects, dress code, giant anteater's leg looking like a panda, a cat or crow, so revealing multiple identities. This one I particularly like, a plant that looks like hummingbirds. I mean, really? Um, moth owls. Uh, this is a woman in body paint. Uh, this is a tree stump and a human fingerprint. And this is accessing a liminal state through just looking at water in a new way. So accessing a wormhole through water. <laughs> um, so on to the next section, Holotech and Moist Media. I was very lucky to be involved in the DMT trial with Chris at Imperial. 
This was the drawing that I made after my first EEG phase of the draw uh, phase of the trial. Um, and this is my brain on DMT. This is me before the infusion. This is me afterwards. <laughs> And what was really powerful about this experience was the absolute incredible power of the, the scanner to, to affect the experience. So I've done DMT a lot of times, but never did I have such profound um, revealing. I mean, just the amount of entities that showed up, the variety of them, the um, mad panic in their eyes. Like, what are you doing? Are you dying like... Uh, you know, you're dying, aren't you? They were sort of showing me I'm immortal, but then saying, you're in a human body right now, so don't die. Can we do anything to help? And I spent the entire 40 minutes trying to calm them down. <laughs> so really interested in this language that I see, this hieroglyphic language at the core of my vision every time I take DMT. Um, and I put a post out on this on DMT Hidden History. Um, to, to ask people if they're also seeing this language and people started to send back some fascinating uh, ideas around what that could be. Um, and the closest one was this, still not quite there, but I'm really interested in trying out the DMTX experiment um, that Andrew um, Gallimore's championing as well as people in America. Um, and just a quote from, from Andrew. You will learn how your brain constructs your subjective world and how psychedelic drugs alter the structure of this world. How DMT switches the reality channel by allowing the brain to access information from normally hidden orthogonal dimensions of reality. And finally, you will learn how DMT provides the secret to exiting our universe permanently, to complete the cosmic game and to become interdimensional citizens of hyperspace. Yes, please. <laughs> So another study um, that, we, that we almost started uh, with David Luke and my colleague Mark Ransley, we're very interested in the fact that a lot of people on DMT seem to experience greater senses of space, uh, people reportedly seeing into the fourth dimension, um, and I can certainly attest to that. But what's fascinating is that we can now, um, I'll just give you some visuals of that, so all these sorts of nice ways of accessing these these sort of fractal patterns, um, different dimensions of space, but we can now do things like this. So this is Phologram, and any, any, anything that you can put into a 3D modeling package, you can now place in your visual field. Um, and that includes, includes hyperbolic geometry um, or 4D, 4D designs. So what we want to do is actually get people to take DMT, and this is where the moist media comes in, try the AR experience whilst on the, on the substance to see and test if it indeed does give you greater uh, spatial abilities. And in, in things like virtual reality, we can do this kind of stuff. So this is non-Euclidean space. I'm not going to show you the whole video, but this, um, you need to check this out. Um, I, I mean, I love that what VR can do and what AR can do, and they can do very different things. But this is this is mind blowing stuff. Um, so we've already mentioned moist, moist media. It's the combination of the dryware and the wetware, so the entheogen and the electronics, and not just. Um, so we've also got um, this group on Reddit called Rift Into the Mind, where people are basically looking at all the different psychedelics and then trying them in different VR experiences or different immersive experiences. I looked, up, looked it up just a couple of days ago just to see if what's going on there. And people are basically going into um, these immersive VR experiences on certain substances. Um, it's kind of like the museum dose but uh, for, for immersive experiences. And you can see a lot of this moist media coming up. And it seems to me a new science where people are combining things like ketamine um, and VR to to, to cope with burns, severe burns when they're being um, dressed. Um, and in, in New York, loads of VR um, being used in ketamine clinics to support the journey and the healing process. But we don't just have the, the electronics and the uh, medicines. We also have things like meditation, many different types of meditation that can be placed in, inside a stack. So you could have a, 
a VR experience to start with. Normally with, with Jose, we, we start with meditations and then you go into maybe a VR experience, you do some breath work, then you take an entheogen, then you might go back into VR. So creating these stacks of, and these protocols where we can start to really test um, you know, what effects these are having on which individuals. So all of these become components. So this is five rhythms and there's so many different levels to five rhythms. Um, again, part of the stack. So, so this is exactly what I'm talking about. Different technologies, different types of body work, uh, traditional media, the additional sensors being used. So how will these ingredients affect each other and combine in the stack? What new qualia will, will these synergies create? How can we combine these contexts to create new protocols for generating double consciousness, triple consciousness, quadruple consciousness, and help us see from others' perspectives? So I recently came back from giving a panel uh, with Ray Kurzweil, Director of um, Engineering at Google, and I wrote a talk specifically for him because of his uh, transhumanist ideas. And I started to really explore what transhuman is. And uh, transhumanism arises from humanism um, and is just an amplification of that. So humanism emphasizes the value and agency of human beings individually and collectively. Transhumanism tries to amplify um, a lot of the human characteristics, but also looking to see what we can do with machines as well and whether we can adopt some of their methodologies. Um, so there's loads of good examples of transhumanism, loads of terrible examples. Some of the examples that I've been playing with and trying out, 360 vision, uh, the aroma fort with smell and uh, taste being combined, here on active listening where you can basically change the way you hear the world, Wristify where you change the way you, the temperature of the world, this is digital taste. This is a, a, a musical, uh, basically headphones that stimulate the vagus nerve whilst you're listening to music to transform music as a whole. Um, and more interestingly, um, definitely transhumanism, programmable synthetic hallucinations from MIT, um, which is basically using transcranial stimulation to stimulate the cells in the hypercolumns of V1 to induce basically visual hallucinations. Um, and where does this go? So post-humanism and hyperhumanism is is looking at this idea that the the human is the human condition is not a fixed notion. It's open, um, and it, and we we can not just be focusing on gimmicks, these altered altered states. What about altered traits, perceptual persistence? And the definition of of this uh, movement is that humans are no longer seen as the most important species and I think absolutely critical going forward where we've destroyed you know 60% of everything else in 45 years if we don't radically shift the way we understand what a human is we're in deep trouble and everything else is in deep trouble so there's not just one type of human type of self there's many um, and the third part allows us to see existence in interconnected ways we are really acquiring divine abilities of creation and destruction. For the first time, we are going to have the ability to re-engineer life, to re-engineer bodies and brains and minds. And we have no idea what to do with these powers. If we just leave it to the free market, or if we just leave it to an, to an arms race, it, it guarantees the worst outcome. Which Both is why we need those global institutions that are currently being pulled apart. Yeah, I mean, if you just, you know, if you have an arms race in these technologies, then it's very clear what kind of human abilities are going to be optimized. It will be things like intelligence, things like discipline. Armies and corporations and governments, they want highly intelligent and highly disciplined uh, soldiers and workers and citizens. But other things like uh, compassion, like uh, artistic appreciation, like spirituality, these are things that are not on a very high on the list of armies and corporations. So the attempt to upgrade humans might actually result in downgraded humans, like what we do to the, to the animals. If you compare a domesticated cow to a wild cow, so a domesticated cow produces more milk and is far more obedient, but in almost every other respect, it's a downgrade from the, from the wild cows. And we are on the verge of maybe doing the same thing to human beings. So humankind has not woven the web of life. We are but one thread within it, 
Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together, all things connect. The deer isn't crossing the road, the road is crossing the forest. So moving from this to this, and lots of people are already onto this. This is an artist that doesn't think we're going to evolve into to being robots. He thinks we're going to devolve into being animals, and he's already practicing to be a goat. <laughs> so how do we empathize? How do we get into different umwelts? Uh, we can experience insect vision now. We can have hammerhead vision. We can experience what it's like to have compound eyes. There's a whole history of what it's like to be a bat in philosophy, as Ed Cook in the, in the room will know, um, and has written on. Um, but what, forgetting about VR for a second, what happens if you start to install echolocation directly into your senses? Um, and this is the Trans Species Society. And what about creating these sorts of experiences for other species? So this is a bit of tongue in cheek, but awful lives that a lot of these chickens lead. Um, is it worse or better for them to at least think that they're outside playing in the air, fresh air? They are on, like, as you can see, there are, it's proper matrix, but, uh, you know, this is the kind of stuff that's happening. But how can nature fight back? Fight the drones. So this, this fish is ex escaping flatland. It's controlling its uh, movement around. Imagine what's going on in that fish. <laughs> so hyperhumanism versus transhumanism. So a, a simple example of this is that um, at the bottom there, you've got cyborg's nests, um, North, North Sense. So 300 people installed that device. Um, cyborg nest tagline is, we don't want to wear technology. We want to become it. This is a very transhumanist tagline. Field space, um, however, above that is something that you wear for six to eight weeks and then you have the north sense as a new sense once you've taken it off. So for me, that's hyperhumanism. That's not giving into technology, not using it as a crutch, actually using it as like stabilizers on your bike to get you into a certain state and then you build that state yourself. This is Moon Rebus. Um, oops. Uh, this is Moon Rebus, you can't see her, but she's basically got um, a prosthetic device that um, shakes every time there's an earthquake in the world. So the bigger the earthquake, the larger the, the impact on her. And um, so she's got a direct sense of the earth that nobody else does, not yet. So just finishing off, so plants have an internet of fungus and they're hacking into each other. So I'm really fascinated by the fact that we've got mushrooms who have survived um, five mass extinction, extinctions, and yet we are causing a mass extinction. So what can we learn from mycelium? What can we learn from these uh, incredible beings? And also, what are the limits of our sensing? Um, how can we enable ourselves to sense like a mycelium network or a forest? Um, humans of the past were much more intimate with their ecosystems, and if we were able to survive the climate changes before us, we must reacquaint ourselves with the more than human life that lives beyond the concrete and computers that define modernity. So we imagine how it feels to be a character. Why can't we imagine how the land feels? I don't know if you've seen this. We have a problem with people um, dying. And uh, now we're talking about putting them on the sides of motorways because there's not enough space for them. This is an alternative. Let the mushroom consume you. Um, one of my colleagues, Jay Cousins, I want to be eaten by a mushroom house that I have grown. I want to be food and I want to be habitat. So just the third part of uh, hyperhumanism, seeing existence in interconnected ways. So I'm really fascinated by this idea of non-duality and the entheogens point to this reality. Uh, we think we're sitting inside a room, but actually the room is sitting inside us. And as soon as we can change that shift and have that, have that new perspective, then we can start to adopt that as, an, as a new operating system because we think that we can throw things away, but there is no away because it's all internal to you and everyone else. So I'm, I'm really interested in creating a visual literacy around these ideas, so I've searched for images that can rep, you know, represent these ideas. So these are all ideas around non-duality. <laughs> So 
so, so just to finish, I was super inspired by Eric Davis's recent trip to the UK, and Jose and myself went to see him speak, and I, he really got me thinking about what, what is beyond the white room of the 5-MeO DMT experience. Uh, it's a rude question to ask, really, um, but um, I'm really interested in this idea of pluralism. Uh, there is something about the interpersonal, there is something about the other. One of the problems with the non-dual version of real vision of unity is that it dissolves the radical claim of the other, or the outside, or the beyond. Beyond our categories, beyond our human ways of processing, beyond the sensory extensions of our bodies, there is something other than um, other, and that is the element that really interests me. As we become post-human and we wake up to the fact that we are absolutely embedded in these non-human forces, systems and relationships, instead of emphasizing unity, we should be focusing on pluralism. The actual nature of reality is multiple, so let's try and focus on post-traumatic growth as opposed to stress. Um, and I'm really, just to finish, I'm really interested in this idea of exploring the double consciousness between non-duality and pluralism. Because I think then we start to reveal the cosmic joke, um, which is nicely summarized here. And just to conclude, I don't need spells because I am the spell. VR only exists to show us that this reality has become virtual. Disneyland only exists to show us that the rest of America is real. Amnesia is at the, co is at the core of the operating of reality, so let's utilize it. And the healing of the land and the purification of the human spirit is exactly the same process. We've got an event coming up on the 21st of August where we're going to have a citizens' assembly around a lot of these ideas, myself and Jose. Thank you very much. <laughs>